Uh, good morning, church. It is great to be with you. My name is Carl. I love to serve you in this way by preaching God's word to you. Um, I want to start by taking you back to my early 20s when really one of the most exciting days of my early 20s when I got to go to Adelaide Oval for a cricket game, Australian cricket game, and got to sit in the member stand. So I thought. Uh, I was a big cricket uh, fan when the Australian cricket team was really at its height, right? So I'm talking Shane Warne, I'm talking David Boone, I'm talking Glenn McGrath, the, the height, in my opinion, of Australian cricket. And then so this one, um, you know, test match that was, that was on, uh, you know, if you're a true fan, you're either in one of two places, you're on the hill, and I was too scared for that, uh, or you end up in a different place, you end up in uh, the member stand. And this one time I got a ticket to go to uh, uh, the Australian cricket test match, got to go to the member stand, got this lanyard around my neck, and just super excited to go to the cricket. Uh, go to the members stand, right? You know, chest puffed up, hair blowing in the breeze. And then um, I got asked two questions at the gate by the security person. I got asked the question, uh, where's your members ticket? I could show them that. Then the next question they asked me was interesting. They said, where's your collar? Right? Like, where, where's the collar on your shirt? Um, I didn't know the fine print, right? I just thought that to get into the member stand, all you needed was a ticket, love for the game, then in you go. Um, but the fine print as that, uh, that, um, that came with my ticket said that everyone who enters the member stand also needs a shirt with a collar on. I, didn't, I don't know if you knew this. The fine print. You could only be truly accepted if you had this additional um, requirement met, the collar. And as I think about being a Christian now for 25 years, almost 25 years, I'm confident that many people see Christianity in the same way, that you're not actually saved by grace, but there is some fine print, right? There's some fine print that every Christian needs to adhere to and without, and you know, believing in that fine print or living up to the standard of that fine print, then you're never really truly accepted. And you see it uh, where people might say things like, um, you might have family and friends who have said, um, there's no way that my, um, my good deeds will outweigh my bad, right? And then so in their mindset, they've got a works mindset. Like you can believe in Jesus, but you've got to have all your works sorted out. Or people might say something like, um, uh, no one from my family could ever end up in a church or no one from my family could ever end up in heaven. And for them, the thing that gets you in right relationship with God is the love of God plus kind of your, your family lineage, right? And for other people, it's like the, uh, the amount that they serve in church, whether they listen to the right music or the wrong music, involved in the right Bible college or the wrong Bible college. Paul writes this letter to the church in Galatia that we're studying today to tell them, friends, the way that you come into right relationship with God is God's grace poured out on believers and you accept this grace through faith. That is it. That is what we mean when we say we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, that we are saved by God's grace, that God looks on his people and delights to choose him. We are saved through faith, not by works, not that we climb up a ladder, but it is through our faith in Christ, in his finished work that leads to our salvation. And what is true as if, is, that, is this, is that if we aren't a people who defend the gospel, then the gospel will always become distorted. If we are not a people who defend the gospel, then this great hope that we have, this gospel grace that we have, this um, that we know that we are saved um, by grace, fully accepted and loved by our Father, this truth gets distorted. And we've seen this all throughout history. The gospel gets distorted. And so what we're going to see in our text this morning is that Paul is going to um, defend the gospel. And through it, we're going to take a class in defending the gospel. You might call this defending the gospel 101. We're going to learn why we should defend the gospel. And then also a couple of reasons how we should, or a couple of methods for how we should defend the gospel. And so our first point is this in why we should defend the gospel. 
We should defend the gospel because it is a priority of Christ. We should defend the gospel because it is a priority of Christ. Look in your Bibles in Galatians 2, verse 1 and 2. It says this, Then after 14 years, I, being Paul, went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles, in order to make sure that I was not running or had not run in vain. So here is the scene. The scene is that Paul, the apostle, has taken Barnabas and Titus up to the Jerusalem headqu- uh, the, the apostles' headquarters in Jerusalem, right? So we've got, um, we see in this text, Peter, James, and John um, yeah, with the church in Jerusalem, and Paul goes up to this church in Jerusalem to defend the gospel against these Judaizers, these um, people who sought to add to the gospel from the Jewish tradition. Paul goes up to defend the gospel. That's what he was doing. Now, why was he doing this? He was doing it because the text says, I went up because of a revelation. Now, this is the same language that he uses in chapter 1, where he says that Jesus appeared to him by a revelation. That what we see is this. Jesus commanded Paul to go and defend the gospel. Jesus commanded Paul to go and defend the gospel. Now, it is true that this is a particular command to a particular person, but the call to defend the gospel is the universal call on the church. Listen to, um, listen to your scriptures. Jude writes this in Jude 3. I found it necessary to write appealing to you, he writes this to the church, to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Peter writes this, and we should know this well from our last series. Always be prepared to make it offence to anyone who asks you for a reason that the hope for the hope that is in you. Titus writes this, or Paul writes this to Titus, um, on the requirements of being a church elder. He says this, He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. The call on the church is to be a defender of the gospel. Um, In uh, 1159, uh, John Salisbury, a 12th century philosopher, said this, We see more and farther than our predecessors, not because we have a keener vision or greater height, but because we are lifted up and borne aloft on their gigantic stature. I don't know if you've heard this phrase before, that we stand on the shoulders of giants, meaning that um, our ability, our um, opportunity, um, even our convictions come as a result of the many men and women who have gone before us, that we get this privileged position, the, um, the comfort that we have in this world, the freedom that we have in this world, because of the people who have gone before us. And it is also true that this gospel freedom that we have, that you and I are benefiting from today, doesn't just come by the word of God, but also comes because of the many, many people who have defended this word, who have defended the gospel along the way. And the Gnostics in the first century believed that there were different classes of Christians, that um, there, was certain, there was a certain group of Christians that um, had, had to go to this other group of Christians who had special access to God. This was a heresy that needed to be defeated. The gospel needed to be defended. That Jesus Christ died for all people so that all people could have full access to God. Um, Palladianism in the 5th century believed that you could actually be saved completely apart from grace but by your works. We know that um, for many generations, Catholics taught that you could purchase right access to God. And they still teach that you, um, can, you need a mediator to be able to access God through, um, through prayers and to seek forgiveness. Um, more recently, the Mormons. The Mormons have so distorted the gospel, so added to the gospel, that though they often use the same language, the gospel that they preach is really no gospel at all. Devastating, right? 
all through the generations, this freedom that we have, that we are fully loved and accepted by the Father, chosen by Him before the foundations of the world, has come under attack. The gospel needs defending. The command to the church is that we would all be gospel defenders. We stand in the position that we're in now because of those people who have gone before us. We stand on their shoulders, right? That's what we can say about previous generations. No wonder this. What will future generations say about us? Is that what they would say about us? That we have given them some strong shoulders to stand on? Do you have gospel clarity? Are you a gospel defender? And if you're not, or if you feel like there is a chink in your armour, what can you do about it? Can you um, devote yourself to the Word of God through um, deep Bible study, through joining a discipleship group, through uh, reading the Bible with a friend, or dare might I say it, that you would take a year off and go to Bible college? So that you would defend the gospel so that in generations to come, they would look at our generation and say, thank you for the strong shoulders that was able to create this gospel freedom that we have today. So the first reason that we should defend the gospel is because it's a priority to Christ clearly revealed in his word. And the second reason that we should defend the gospel is because it protects the church. Look down in your Bible at verse two. Um, Paul says this. I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I uh, proclaim among the Gentiles in order to make sure that I was not running or had not run in vain. Now, why would Paul think that he might be running in vain? You might think, well, um, it's an issue with his apostleship. So maybe the issue is this that Paul is unsure about whether he's actually an apostle or not. And so he has come up to Jerusalem to see Peter, James and John. This text describes them as pillars in the church um, to get approval for his apostleship. Is that what's going on? Well, I would say that there is almost, now I'm going to say it, there is entirely no chance that is true because it totally defeats his entire argument from chapter 1. Remember, he said that he was an apostle, not appointed by man, but appointed by Jesus Christ and God the Father. Paul was confident that his apostleship came from the Lord. So it's not something that he would think was ever under threat. And he would never think that he's running in vain because he was never a true apostle. It seems that his argument is this, that Paul was concerned that if there was a split between the theology of Paul and the theology of the apostles, then there would be a split in the church. And the fallout of this split in the church would be the casualties of all these, not, all these new converts that Paul had led to the Lord. That when there is disunity in the church, there are casualties. And when there is disunity in the church, God's mission is disabled. Listen to Jesus' words. Jesus says this the night before he was betrayed and arrested. In John 17, verses 20 to 21, he says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us. Now listen to this. So that the world may believe that you have sent me. That Jesus argued, or in this, in this way he was praying, that the unity that was experienced in the church might reflect um, the unity that Jesus has to the Father out in the world, right? That a key missional strategy of the church is unity. So we have the church where um, every tribe, every tongue, every nation, right? Male and female, all ages, coming together together. Despite their social backgrounds, despite their interests, despite the, all the, the different circumstances that have led them to be there, um, have all come together, right? There is no, for, and there is no good reason that all these people would come together apart from something quite extraordinary. And that something quite extraordinary is the hope of the gospel, right? 
that when all these people from all these different arenas come together, what we see is the gospel outworking in the world. That it says that we are a united people, right? That I have more in common with a Christian from Sudan than I do my next door neighbor. If um, my next door neighbor doesn't know the Lord. Because me and my friend, my brother in Sudan, will be united in Christ for the rest of our lives, right? And the world looks upon this relationship and says, how is this possible? How is it possible that there could be this much unity between people? And the answer is the hope of the gospel. Unity creates opportunity for mission. Therefore, disunity destroys opportunity for mission. The church must be protected. The gospel must be defended for it protects the church. Uh, We actually had a fight for the gospel in City Light East. And that attack was actually aimed at me. Uh, Let me tell you the story. So at the start of the year, uh, you you would know that City Light East uh, advocates for church membership. We believe that church membership is the um, safest and easiest way to create clear serving um, pathways in the church and also clear and safe um, caring pathways in the church. So we instituted membership. But what we also said that was that to become a member at our church, all you needed to believe in were the tenets of the gospel that we would be united around gospel centrality, and that would be it, right? Nothing on top of that, just the gospel. And then so I got, a, um, I got contacted by one of our members that said, oh, in the form uh, for the commitment form, that you've actually put down that um, I need to be baptized as an adult to be a member in the church, right? But this person had a conviction that, Um, infant baptism is taught in the scripture, which I don't think it is, but um, I always said that membership would um, would be dealt based on gospel tenets. And this person said, because we see it different, this issue differently on baptism, does that mean that I'm excluded from the fellowship? That's an important question, right? Are we making secondary theological beliefs or what we might call open handed issues? Theological issues where there is debate within the church, are we making them um, uh, front doors or closed doors to fellowship in the church? That was a great question. And I had to go back and go, I think I've done the wrong thing. And so we changed that form. And now you would see in the membership form, it just says that you need to be baptized at all, right? So it, a um, either as an infant or an adult, because part of living out the gospel is obedience. And so I think that's the right thing to do. So um, I was challenged, right, to keep the gospel pure in the church. And now it is true that uh, my mistake was accidental and it was easily fixed. But it is also true that many churches will actually advance um, additions to the gospel and it is not part of their blind spot. It is front and center. You will hear churches that will say that you're not truly saved unless you've got the right, right version of the Bible. You will hear churches say that you're not really saved if your church plays that kind of music and not this kind of music. You will see churches say that you're not really saved unless your experience of the Holy Spirit mirrors the experience of believers of the... uh, uh, Let me say this again. You will hear churches say that you are not really saved unless your experience of the Holy Spirit mirrors the experience of the Holy Spirit among the believers in the book of Acts. Right? That when the Holy Spirit first exploded onto the scene, that should be the ongoing experience for believers for all time. You're not really a Christian unless you've had that experience. All of those three examples, I believe the gospel flatly rejects. You are saved by grace. The Father delights to pour his love on you, delights to send his son for you, delights to have his son pay the ultimate price for you. So that you could be in right relationship with him, not through getting your work sorted out, but through faith in the finished work of Christ. This is a message that needs defending so that the church would be a united front so its mission can burst forth in the world. So why should we defend the gospel? Because it's a priority to Christ and also because it protects the unity of the church. Uh, thirdly, we should defend the gospel because it protects God's children. 
Uh, look down your Bibles at verse 3. It says this. Uh, but even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. But even Titus. Who is this man, Titus? Well, Paul loved Titus. Um, Paul, uh, Titus was a travelling companion of Paul. Um, Paul took Titus uh, everywhere with him. Not all the time, but a lot of different places with him. So much so that when Paul writes to a letter to Titus, he calls him his true son in the common faith. What we know about Paul was that Paul was a Jew, and he kind of describes himself as being a Jew of Jews, you know, circumcised on the eighth day, and he had, um, was excelling in the traditions of his fathers. And Titus had no such experience. The text tells us that he was a Greek, meaning that he was not one who had adopted Jewish traditions. He was not one who had been involved in Jewish ceremonies. He, the text says that um, Peter, James and John did not force Tita, Titus, Titus to be circumcised. Right? This is kind of the first example of we, that we see where the false brothers are seeking to add to the gospel. They seem to be adding circumcision, this Jewish tradition where on the eighth day young men would be circumcised to show how the um, Jewish people were set apart, distinct from the rest of the world. And uh, Peter, James and John, and certainly Paul, did not ask Titus to be circumcised. circumcised. See, this gospel defending that Paul was doing wasn't just academic. It affected the life, the real genuine life of an individual. That Titus was either a person who was enjoying the gospel, right? Um, Every day, um, recognizing that he was fully accepted and loved by God, not because of his works, chosen before the foundations of the world, um, that he was loved by the Father and didn't need to earn it, just needed to receive it by faith. Or... He was deceived and he'd been living this deception, this life of deception. He was not actually a true um, believer and he needed to add works. And what we see from this text is that Titus, who was with Paul, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. This academic conversation, defending the gospel, turned personal. It is true that defending the gospel affects the lives of people. It's what Paul writes in Ephesians 2. He says, And Jesus gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we attain the unity of the faith. Then he says this in verse 14. So that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried out by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness, in deceitful schemes. I don't know if you've ever been, you know, out in the ocean swimming in a beach and it, the, the waves start like, um, you know, getting bigger and bigger and bigger. You might be at like Boomer's Beach down Victor Harbour way um, and you try to come back in and on the way back in, you get smashed and smashed and smashed. You get dumped and dumped and dumped by wave after wave. Well, Paul uses that kind of picture to describe every wind and wave of doctrine Not true gospel doctrine, but a doctrine that's cunning, a doctrine that is craftiness in deceitful schemes, um, smashing on the lives of individual people that Christ has called to enjoy the gospel, right? But these people, the apostles and prophets who are the foundations of of, of the world, a foundation of the church, and then the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers need to defend the gospel for the sake of the lives of real genuine people who are seeking to know God, be known by him, and enjoy this gospel freedom. Um, Barna Group said that most Christians profess their faith in Christ in their teenage years. It also said that most Christians renounce their faith in their young adult years. They enjoy their faith as a youth, and then when they hit the young adult world, something happens that makes them push their faith away. And I would say that in my experience, the reason why so many young adults push their faith away is that they head out into the world, head out into university life. And as the critiques, the spiritual attacks, the philosophical, uh, the, the philosophy and the theological attacks come pouring in, those that haven't built a strong gospel foundation crumble. We've seen it time and time and time again. 
that young people enjoy church life, enjoy the community, enjoy the motivation, but they haven't been given true gospel foundation. So when the the difficulty comes, the waves start crashing in around them, these crafty, deceitful schemes start coming in, all they can do is crumble because they have no foundation. Friends, the gospel needs defending for the lives of real people. Don Carson uh, said this, uh, No one believes more than I that every Christian should be a theologian. I would take that one step further to say every Christian is a theologian, right? A theologian is one who studies God. And if you're watching this video right now, you're studying God. So I would say every Christian is a theologian. But the question is, are you a useful one, right? As people have come to you and asked you questions about God, Have you been able to clarify the gospel? Have you been able to clearly lay out the foundations of the gospel so someone might know how to be saved? Now, I know what it's like to be kind of bailed up in a pinch where someone asks you a particularly pointy question. You try your best to answer it. Your answer falls flat on the ground and you kind of your shoulders slump and you walk away feeling a bit sheepish. Friends, that happens to us all. I would say... What is your resolve? Is your resolve to be defeated by that? Or is your resolve to dive deeper into the word, deeper into the gospel, so that in future generations, you might have people that would look back and say, I was led to the Lord through someone defending the gospel at City Light East. I was led to the Lord because of the clarity that Geordie gave to me, the clarity that Jake gave to me, the clarity that Stephen gave to me, the clarity that Judith gave to me. These people fiercely defending the gospel is the reason that I am saved. Friends, there are great reasons to defend the gospel. So my question to you is, what is your conviction? Are you going to be a gospel defender? I hope so. What we see next in the text is Paul gives us a couple of methods for how we should go about defending the gospel. So we've seen three reasons for why we should defend the gospel. Reason number one, it's a priority for Christ. Reason number two, it protects the church. Reason number three is that it protects God's children. Now we see how we should defend the gospel. And the first how of defending the gospel is this. We should defend the gospel peaceably. Peaceably. Look down at verse two again. Paul says this, I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately, before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. Um, Paul sought confrontation, but he sought an outcome more than he sought a scene. It seems that what happened was that Paul went up to Jerusalem and met with Peter, James and John. But the text clearly says that he sought them out privately. Paul sought an outcome. He didn't desire attention. He didn't desire a crowd. But he sought to respect those, even those people he sought to confront. Now, in the uh, early 2000s, there was this phrase that was coined. Uh, This phrase that when you hear it, uh, you'll either not know what it means or if you have heard it, you'll feel like these kind of nails down the chalkboard, these kind of nails down your your spine. Um, It is the phrase virtue signaling, right? Um, For those of you that don't know what it means, uh, it's it's seeking to describe people who, uh, you know, might jump online and complain about something that's going on in the world. And rather than really desiring an outcome, what they're trying to do is let everyone know that they're a person of great morals, great moral character, and you should look upon them as a kind of moral authority. They're signaling to the world how virtuous they are. And we see people doing this against politicians. We see people doing it against people who... Um, are having to deal with the laws um, around COVID. We see that people do this about actors and we see people do this around when natural disasters happening. And we certainly see people do this to Christian leaders in the world. Rather than seeking an outcome, what they seek to do is to cause a scene. And what Paul says is the way that we should go about defending the gospel is that we should go about it peaceably. We should do it with 
great peace. Uh, He writes this in his letter to the Romans. He says in chapter 14, verse 19, So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. You know, I've been critiqued many times in my leadership here at City Light East by the members of the church. And I can say with a heart full of joy that every single time I've been critiqued, it's been done with great respect. Every single time. I can genuinely not think of a time that I've been critiqued at City Light East where I can't pat the person on the back for the way that um, they went about it. And the good news of that is that so often when I've been treated with respect and humility, it's been so easy to hear the heart of the person that often the person has got whatever they wanted. Like in terms of their critique, I was able to respond favorably to most of those requests because their critique was so easy to hear. When you speak to someone with great peace, even defending something as serious as the gospel, it makes the heart behind your critique so easy to hear especially when our words can so often betray us. So we should remember, how do we go about defending the gospel? The gospel, We do it pursuing peace, right? We do it um, peaceably. That should be our attitude. Now, secondly, and, and lastly from this text, how should we go about defending the gospel? We should go about defending the gospel with great resilience. Look down at verse 4. Paul writes this, Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out the freedom that we have in Christ Jesus, so that they might bring us into slavery. That's a sermon on its own, right? These false brothers that had come in uh, weren't just seeking to, you know, sprinkle some um, fairy dust on the gospel to kind of shine it up. Any addition to the gospel actually makes the gospel dirty. It actually, may, actually puts mud on the gospel. And here Paul uses the language that it binds us into slavery. Any addition to the gospel adds to grace and binds us to works. It's what Paul was defending. So we have these false brothers who have secretly uh, been brought in. They've slipped in to spy out this freedom, to attach slavery. And then Paul says, to them... Uh, He says, to them, we did not yield in submission, even for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. He says he didn't even yield for a moment, which must mean that there was opportunity to yield, right? Maybe no temptation to yield, but certainly opportunity. Maybe they attacked him for not being a true apostle. Maybe they attacked him because he was not, um, you know, loud and proud in stature. And Paul talks about that. Uh, Maybe uh, they critiqued him because he wasn't as a gifted communicator. And Paul speaks about how um, Christians would, uh, from the church, would look upon the preaching of Apollos as more beautiful and more pithy than Paul. He received all these attacks, but for the sake of the gospel, he did not yield. For the sake of the gospel, he did not yield even for a moment. He should not yield and neither should we. Why? Because we were born for resilience, right? made in his workmanship, placed in he- here in this earth, filled with the Holy Spirit, to be in this world, not of the world, to be salt and light. We are not here as brittle people. We are here to be resilient. Only believers in Christ are filled with the Spirit. Only believers in Christ have received the Great Commission. Only believers in Christ have been resourced for the greatest mission that this world has ever known. We should also be resilient for what we are defending. We are defending something so beautiful, the gospel. Um, uh, if you, there's this story in the 1996 Olympics of this woman, Kerry Strug. And um, it's quite a phenomenal um, moment in the Olympics where uh, America were battling Russia for the gold medal in team gymnastics and Kerry steps up to do the vault, right? And she, um, she's got two vaults left to go. And if she does okay in both of those vaults, the Americans get the gold. If they fail, then they do not get the gold. Total movie scene, right? Total movie. I don't know why this hasn't been made into a movie. Maybe they did and I just missed it, but this is a movie scene. And so Kerry um, does her first vault and seems to like badly twist her ankle, right? So she kind of lands on her feet, then hits her butt, 
not a great vault, and then she hobbles back to the starting line. And you can see this on YouTube, right? It's really profound. Don't go to it now. Don't look it up now, but just keep that thought in your mind. And then Kerry, um, for a second vault, runs up to the vault, does her spins and flips, and then one foot, right? It's like a one leg crushes this landing and the Americans win the gold. Now, why did, how could she do this, right? She could do this because she was built for resilience. She was a gymnast. She had trained. She was built for resilience. And she had a goal in mind, the goal of gold. Friends, we are built to be resilient. Christians are born for resilience, salt and light in the world of darkness. That is who we are. And this world needs gospel defenders who are a resilient people. Resilient to get the gospel to the world. And a resilient people who understand what we're fighting for. We are not fighting for no thing. We are fighting for something that is so significant. The gospel of grace and peace in the world. And so um, why should we defend the gospel? Let's review It's a priority to Christ. It protects the church, protects God's children. How should we defend the gospel? We should defend the gospel peaceably and we should defend the gospel with great resilience. Now let's ask the question, just as we close, um, what's to be lost if we just ignore all this? What's to be lost if we just see this as another um, teaching moment like when we're in year nine maths and it's just another class and it'll be forgotten uh, much more than it'll be remembered. What if we put aside defending the gospel? What will happen? What will happen is this. The world around us will grow believing that they need to be wearing a collar. They will grow in the knowledge believing that this gospel is not by grace But just like how I entered that cricket ground and didn't know that I needed to wear a collar, you'll have people who will believe that there must be some kind of fine print to our faith. right? There must be some kind of added extra that the gospel is not by grace, but the gospel is actually grace plus a whole bunch of other stuff. And the world will say that's a burden too heavy to carry. And the truth of the gospel is that it is. It is a burden too heavy to carry. That's why Jesus carried it for all of us, so that we would be saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Jesus Christ died for you, right? And if you're a Christian right now, what that means is that you're enjoying gospel freedom. That's the gift, right? And we get to defend the gospel so the whole world would know that. Your friends and your family would know this truth. And so can we be a church? Can we be a people that are committed to defending the gospel? If that, need, if that means that you need to increase your Bible reading a day, every day, wouldn't we do that for something so precious? If that means that we need to get in a Bible study group with our peers and to really um, you know, feast and investigate um, what it means to, uh, to be saved by grace, to lean upon the gospel, then wouldn't we do it? And for some of you, I want to say, what it's going to mean for you is that you need to take a year out of your life to go to Bible college, right? To go deep into God's word, because there's no greater investment in your life than diving deep into God's word. And we do this for the sake of generations to come. Let me pray for us all. Uh, God, we uh, want to be a people who so enjoy the gospel that we understand the significance of defending it. I pray for each person now that they would be gospel enjoyers, that they would lean upon you, and they'd be so committed to defending the gospel because it is such a treasure worth defending. pray these things in your name. Amen.